Now, let me say this. First, I want to say thank you to everybody that is on the live, everybody that's on Facebook, everybody anywhere, everybody that will do the replay. We want to say thank you to everyone because we know that you'll get something from this Zoom and this Facebook Live that you'll be able to help someone else. Now, we're going to be talking about a subject today that a lot of people have difficulties talking about. You think, Miss Lott? A lot of people have difficulties talking about it. And one of the reasons they have difficulty talking about it is because in time past, it was a little bit taboo. You know, people just thought, you know, they internalized it as being their fault, just lots of things behind it. But what we're learning today as life coaches and authors and people that deal with teenagers specifically and other people, we're learning that if we don't talk about it, we really can't address it, mm-hmm. cannot address things that we don't talk about. So thank you, thank you, thank you to Ms. Clark Galley, Ms. Clark Dean Galley. She has decided to come and talk with us today. And I and, and look, all the time when my children say that I'm interviewing people or that I'm on talking, they say, mama, let the people talk. So <laughs> What I am going to do, I'm going to let our guests talk today. And what we'll do, we'll ask some questions probably toward the end. We like for her to, you know, keep her train of thought. And sometimes she'll answer the question during her presentation. So we're going to let Ms. Clark Dean Galley help us today. And we'll walk away with something that we didn't come to the presentation with. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Coach Lily. I appreciate it. And I can see the chat. So if you have something you want to put in there while we discuss, that's fine. And then I'm happy to answer questions or, or just talk a little bit more from your perspective later. Um, two years ago, this March, my 19-year-old son took his life. And it was devastating to our family. It was shocking. We had no clue. And so I'll sort of walk through our story with you and explain some things that I wish I had known as a parent before this happened. And also what I would wish that youth would know, what my what I wish my son could have known and what I wish maybe his friends could have known because they also played a, a part in this. And so uh, first of all, suicide happens for many, many reasons. There's no one thing that we can say, oh, it was this, this one thing in all cases, there's a variety of reasons. And, and like Coach Lily was saying, suicide has had such this stigma. My father actually died by suicide five years before my son did. Now, that, so it's been seven years now. And at the time, because of the stigma and the shame I felt around it, I couldn't even talk about it. My best friends didn't know that that's the way he died. And so I understand that if, if sometimes you're feeling like, oh, this is, this is not a topic we can talk about, I understand that. And that's when my son died by suicide, I started to go there. I started to say, I don't want to talk about it. It's too embarrassing. I'm too ashamed. But what happened was some mothers, some friends of mine reached out to me and they were so concerned about me and what had happened and also their children. They had teenage children who knew my son. And if you've heard about copycat suicide, this is a real thing where one kid takes their life and then the next, the next, there was a high school that's two cities away from me. They had 14 kids take their life in just four months. It was devastating. And because these moms reached out and it just touched me and it moved my spirit, I said, I can't change the past. And whether or not my son took his life because I was a bad parent, it's not about me. This is about the opportunity I have so that one more parent doesn't have to go through what my husband and I went through, so that one more child can choose to make a difference in in choosing to stay alive. Because I knew that I couldn't control whether these kids took their life or not but what can I control? I can control one thing. 
And that one thing is me and whether or not I'm willing to speak out. And so I will tell you, it took a few days and I, I was afraid to talk about this publicly because I thought, well, what if people think I'm a bad parent? What if people look down on me or, or I just get shamed for talking about this? And, and I finally realized I, it doesn't matter. And I will tell you, so many people have been so supportive of my message and they have been so kind and understanding. And, and I really appreciate that because as you can imagine, it's not been always easy to talk about it. Um, there's always these layers of grief and sometimes it's harder than others. But I, I just felt it was my, now my life's calling to tell people, especially parents, you need to wake up because back three years ago when the school that had the 14 suicides in just a few months, they were a couple cities away from me. They really, they're a 10 minute drive from me. They're not that far away. But when I heard about it, I said, oh, that's over there. That's outside. That's not in my home. That wouldn't happen in my home. And that was one of the biggest mistakes I ever made was assuming that it was outside because it's not outside. Um, suicide is the, the number 10 killer of youth nationwide. And the sad part about that is that these are deaths that didn't need to happen. And so that is why I am so concerned. And when we look at someone who has suicide, taken their lives by suicide or attempted suicide, we shouldn't shame them and we shouldn't think terrible things about them because these are people that were hurting so badly that they felt the only way to stop this pain was to end their life. And they, they were not selfish in that. There are actually a lot of people who take their own life think that they're doing it to help their family. They think that they're a burden on their family and that they, they, their family would be so much better off. But I'm telling you, that is not the case at all. Your family needs you so much and we, we actually need each other. And so I just wanna point that out is, is as parents, we need to let our children know that we love them, that we support them, never allow them to feel that they're a burden. Um, the thing about my son's relationship with me is he was very smart. He was, he was in the engineering program at the University of Utah. He had friends, he had hobbies, he had a whole life ahead of him. He was not one of these kids that you would look at and say, oh, he's, he's got problems, he's a troubled youth, or he's going to end up a bad kid. And, and so we can't look at other kids and, and just assume that everything's fine. In fact, a lot of the the parents that I've come in contact with when they talk about their children who have passed by suicide, these are usually the kindest children, the kids that are willing to go out and help other people. They're more empathetic. They're more compassionate. They understand people who are hurting because they are hurting so much. These are the kids who, who have their whole life ahead of them, who look like things are great and don't always talk about their problems. And so we can't ever assume oh, that's a troubled child. That's the one that's going to take their life. Sometimes it's the kid that's doing the best in school or is the top athlete. Coach Lilly? Yeah, that, I, and I wanted to just hold you right there for one moment because a lot of times that's what people think when there's a uh, teenager, young adult, or when someone takes their lives, a lot of times our mind will go to a troubled child or troubled youth or those kinds of things. But from what I'm learning and from what you already know, that is not the case all the time. So sometimes there are things going on with our teens that we just miss. And sometimes, you know, we have uh, given them names like, well, they're just being a teenager or Maybe they are just, uh, you know, maybe, or this is just something that's, that's happening or going to happen. But with your team, and now that you are addressing our audience, is there something that you didn't see then that you know how hindsight is always 2020? Yeah, that there's probably something you say and we really want to applaud you for talking with us. We never want 
to intend parenting skills come into this play or anything like that? Is there something that you saw then or is there something you want us to see that you didn't see or address? Sure. Please. I will, I will tell you this. Um, three and a half years before my son took his life, he was 15, almost 16. He was starting his sophomore year. And you have to understand my household. My husband was 35 years in the military. So we ran a tight ship, right? It was, it was very structured. This is the way it is. And um, my husband was having that, the talk with my son, they were sitting out on the front porch, school was starting. And my husband was really like putting on the thumbscrews, son, you're a sophomore now, your grades count. If you want to get into engineering, like you want to do, you need to, you know, grades. And he was kind of putting a lot of pressure on, on him, you know, to help him see the big picture, which is hard because as a parent, you want your kids to do well. And that's the hard line. How far do you push? Do you, you know, do we push too much or do we not push enough? That's a hard line. And we need to have some interaction with it, with our kids and be able to have really good conversations with them. So my husband was having this conversation and because my husband has had military training for suicide, he noticed that my son started to detach from the conversation. His eyes sort of detached, glazed. He could see he wasn't, wasn't um, really participating. He wasn't really there. My husband had the presence of mind to ask my son, are you feeling suicidal? Now that seems like a strange question. And at the time it never would have crossed my mind, but because of my husband's training, he asked that. I believe that because my husband asked that, we got another three and a half years with my son. So my son was honest enough to say, yes, I, I am thinking about suicide. Notice he didn't ask him, are you thinking of hurting yourself? Because a lot of times when people are suicidal, they are already hurting. And they're, they're thinking that, hey, if I end my life, I'm going to stop the pain. So we need to use real words. Are you thinking of killing yourself? Are you thinking of suicide? And we need to be willing to ask that, especially of our children, so we can get some feedback and kind of see what's going on there. So when my, my son answered yes, my husband came into the house and said, my son's name's Christian. He said, Christian is feeling suicidal. Will you stay with him, please? And I'm going to call the army suicide hotline and get him in to see a therapist right away. And so I went and talked to my son and, and even though my father dealt with bipolar and I have a lot of mental illness in my family, different siblings and cousins and aunts and uncles, I had never been to the point where I'd actually come up with, with a thought that I was going to kill myself. So, so even though once in a while we're like, oh man, life's overwhelming, I just wanna be done. That's one thing, but to actually come up with a plan, that, that's a scary step and I, I want to emphasize that. Um, and so even though I took my son's, you know, concerns seriously, I just couldn't understand that, yes, somebody would actually do that, even though my father had died by suicide just a year before that. So, so sometimes with reality, we, we don't always live, you know, our brains can't connect. We, I talked to him, my son agreed that he could make it through the night. He was okay. We got him in to see a therapist the next day. And then over the next couple months, he saw the therapist every, every week. We got a plan for him. Okay, if you're feeling suicidal, what do you need to do? Here's who you call. This is what you need to do. And came up with a plan. And then after two months, he said to me, Mom, I'm good. I got this down. No problem. Here's my biggest regret as a parent. That between that two months when he said, Mom, I'm good, and three years later when he took his life, I never had the presence of mind to ask him about his mental health. How are you doing? How, how are things going? Just check in with him. How are you feeling? Have you had any suicidal thoughts? It just didn't occur to me that that could still be an ongoing issue. And so that's my biggest regret. Parents, we always need to check in, especially right now with the COVID lockdowns and the isolation. All of these things are contributing to, to just feeling overwhelmed, feeling like there's no hope. What are you going to do? You're feeling disconnected from people. All of these things that are so important to nourish our mental health. So that, that is a huge regret. And I just wanted to point that out. Um, 
you know, like I said, it was a blessing that we got those three and a half years. Um, here's something that happened after I wrote my book. So I, I did write a book about this. I felt so impressed to help other parents. And I wanted them to know, you know, if you're having rough relationships with your kid, because I tell you this, this son and me, we, we, but, but it had his entire life. He was very smart. Mom never knew enough. He knew more, very alpha male. And I, um, I just, I wanted to say that there is hope. So please engage with your children. Don't think that, that if you're having a rough relationship, that it's just going to all magically become better. You need to take an active interest in them and their interests. That is so important. And that's another regret that I, that I wish that as a young kid, young child, five, six years old, that I didn't try to do more to understand him. Um, you can imagine, uh, I was in my 30s at the time when he was those that age, and it's, it's often it's career, and you're trying to manage your house and a spouse and all the kids' schedules and running them here and there, and there always seems so much to do that you think, oh, I'll, I'll take care of that later. The relationship will work out, and it doesn't always work out. So mm -hmm. please, if you're feeling some friction, maybe eliminate some things in your life and prioritize the relationship with your children because that is a big regret. It is a huge hole. And every day of my life, I think of my son and um, ways that I wish I had done better. So it's not so much guilt because guilt, um, the definition of guilt means that you have the intent to harm. And I never had the intent to harm my son, my son but I have a lot of regrets. And so from now on going forward, I want to live my life without regrets. So what does that mean? It means maybe that with my other children, I don't get quite as uptight about things. Maybe let a few things slide. If, if it's not critical, don't harp on them. Um, love them. They, they still have consequences. They still need to do things around to help out around the house. They still need to get their homework done. There's consequences. But mm -hmm. I will tell you this, how I, how I parent now is less military and less like strict and more as a guide, more as I am here as my child's advocate. And let's say that a teenager would come to me now, mom, I'm pregnant or mom, I got my, the, my girlfriend pregnant. Instead of maybe like freaking out, like I might've done before. Now it's like, okay, well, how can I support you through this? It doesn't mean that I necessarily condone their choice, but at that point, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to preserve the relationship. That is the most important thing, preserve the relationship. And so th this, that's just some thoughts as a parent, you know, what I, I have changed in my parenting now. Coach Lily, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, I think we, we had a parent uh, or a grandparent to say that this would be great training for parents, everything that you're telling us now. And uh, she had asked the question, how far do we as parents push? You know, when do we lighten up those kinds of things? And I think you mentioned some of that, uh, you know, in your conversations just then. And I know that when we think of those kinds of things, it is just so difficult to tell when we've gone the limit of when we said enough or when we've done enough. I think we as parents, and you can certainly address it, but I think we as parents have to understand that when we do the very best that we can do with the tools that we've gotten, with the information that we've got, uh, that we can settle ourselves to say, I'm comfortable or, or I've done what I can do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how we save ourselves. And okay. before, uh, to our audience, before we close down the line, we'll certainly uh, have Miss um, Galley to let us know, you know, the kinds of things that she's done to heal. But let me read this one um, to you. It says, it's very hard times to understand as a parent that the desires and goals that we have as parents for our children is not the goals that they have for themselves. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, they are not our, us in miniature. And we need to respect that. 
we need to understand that that maybe they don't want to become a doctor you know maybe they want to do something else that's okay it's their life and support them as best you can you know we don't parent by uh by age we parent by maturity and so if you have a, a child who is is capable of you know they're responsible getting getting their chores done getting their work done uh school work being responsible then we need to to, as parents, allow them a little more latitude and and allow them the responsibilities. It's easier to help them understand consequences when they're in our home versus once they're 18 off and doing and they, you know, they maybe don't show up to work or they don't call in sick or they don't let them know and then they get fired because of choices. So sometimes it's, uh, oh, they, they forgot to bring their homework to school. Mom, can you run, bring this to me? No, son, I can't, right? You need to take responsibility. And so it's, it's allowing them to take the consequences of their actions, but still supporting them in a way that will help them. So, so there needs to be a balance. And also, I would, I would suggest this. Um, there are certain touch points throughout a child's day that are most important. And if we can be there for at least three of those, we have done a really good job. So if one of the parents can be there for... First thing in the morning when they wake up, touch point. When they come home from school, touch point. Dinner time is a big touch point. Another touch point is when they go to bed. So, so those, are, those are four critical touch points. And if we can touch them at least twice, you know, with our schedules, if we can touch them at least twice, if not more, that, that would be ideal. The other thing is when kids come home from school, um, if we as a parent say, how was your day? What are they going to say? Good, fine, all right. Those fine, were right. They won't elaborate. So maybe as parents, what we want to say is, what was the high point of your day? Get them to talk, get them to think about what was the high point. And after they talk about that, you can say, well, and then what was the low point? What was kind of a bummer for you today? And get them to talk about that. Get them to have these feelings, these up and down, so that they can acknowledge, you know, and, and have that feeling spectrum versus fine. Because I will tell you this from personal experience, when you flatline emotionally, you're just a step away from flatlining physically because you detach yourself. So, so that's a way we can get our kids to engage with us. So emotional connection, yes. Mm. So, so that's some things. And Anything else on that, Coach Lily, before I move to the kids, what the kids can do? And that was my question. I was thinking myself, because you, you initially mentioned, you know, it's everybody's responsibility, even our friends. And that's where, you know, when we replay and, and there's some teenagers or some more students and kids getting this uh, information, sometimes we want to know what their, uh, what they think their, position is when some of their friends have done this and how they're feeling and all those kinds of things. And right now I'm seeing from one of our students, uh, she's in college now, and uh, she's saying- in, 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 Yes, Miss Lily. Yes. Yes, Miss Lily. I'm on right now. I, I am in college right now. I'm actually planning on moving back home. And I would like to say something. I do have a friend. She is. She does have suicidal thoughts. She has tried to commit the act and right now she is in school she's in college and um being her friend it has um I've gotten closer with her in our last two high school years and that's what she told me I never knew like what was going on in the home I knew she had like troubles because when she would come to school it was uh, she I would always be like a shoulder to lean on so I've known her since like sixth grade, but when she told me, it was kind of strange for me because I had never come across a person who said, I'm suicidal, I'm thinking about suicide, I'm thinking about killing myself, I'm thinking about harming myself. I had never come into a situation where I had to hear those words. And being her friend, her best friend, it was hard for me at first to actually sit down and actually listen to this rather than other things that were going on or other problems. So like the things that Ms. Lark was saying, like as a parent 
and the parental like guidance that she had, I can understand where it comes from. Like, do we like do parents push? And yeah, she had a very strict home and it was kind of like pressure. So as a friend, it was very it's very hard when you are not accustomed to like hearing these type of conversations and these type of uh, uh, tools to hear and to guide us on how to help one another. So yeah, it's, it's very, it's being a friend as a, um, a peer and being as a youth is kind of hard because we, um, at one point in time I was, when she told me about it, I'm thinking, well, do I put um, pressure on her do I cause her any hurt do I say things that might push her towards you know killing herself and it's 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 like very hard right now she is very um she's good but like Miss um Lart was saying how the mental health like checking up on people like keeping the mental health going like asking like from our 12th grade year to now I try to keep uh, a checkpoint on her, like asking, do you, do you feel suicidal t- today? Are you okay? How was your week? What was a great point in your life, you know, for this week? What happened? What went on? Who have you talked to? You know, things like that. Yeah. So I love when Miss Lark has said about how she, she should have, like, she regretted not asking the question, like keeping it on her mind the mental health of you know her son so I that's one thing that I did like for myself I had to make sure that I put in my mind that she is this is her mental status right now so I need to keep up my question and keep up my concern whether she said she's all right or not yes so yeah exactly. exactly no and those are some great concerns and I will tell you a really big segment um, that's that tends to get um, suicidal is the call it these young adults. You know, you're 18 to 24, right in there. Especially right, right now. I mean, think about having gone through 2020. Uh, right. They don't know what their future holds. They're very uncertain. Okay, are they going to be able to get a job and start a career and pay all right. of the, the, you know, all of the student loans and and be able to even afford to pay rent. Right. There are a lot of concerns, and I will tell you this too, that the highest suicide spikes tend to be in the spring and the fall, and that might be related to uh, midterms for, for school kids. So just think about that. You know, it's not the middle of winter when people are so depressed. They're so depressed mm-hmm. they can't even kill themselves. They're that depressed, but then they start to feel a little better, and then they're like, right. oh, I feel better. Now I can go kill myself. It's like, what are you thinking? So I'm so glad right. you got to talk to your friend and, and, you know, and maybe it's talking to your friend. And, and if she says that she's feeling a lot of pressure from her family, maybe it's that she needs to go and, and talk to her family about this, because right. I can promise you her family will want her around. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, even if she doesn't measure up to all of these outrageous ex- expectations, they right. want her around. And that's where as parents, we need to realize we right. cannot parent like we were parented. We just cannot. Life right. has changed. So I want all my parents to think about when you were in high school, think about the stupidest, most embarrassing thing that ever happened to you. And how many people knew? Maybe for me, I remember I had a terrible thing happened in high school. I was so embarrassed. Maybe 10 people knew. Our children are dealing with pressures that we can't even understand. And so let's say that, that they, the same thing happens to them, that very embarrassing thing, and not 10 people know, but 1,000 people, 2,000, 3,000. With social media, it can happen just right away. And they feel like their life is over. And so we need to understand and create a relationship with our children and our loved ones that they understand that it doesn't matter what happens you still love them, you'll still support them, and you will help them through no matter what. And as kids, you need to understand that you have value and that you are important no matter what happens. You know, we, 
we can get bullied or we can, somebody can say something that's not very nice and they don't even realize how it affects us. And if we know that we matter and that we're important, then what someone else says to hurt us, it's not going to hurt us badly because we're important. And I just want to point this out. Over my life, I've had three different coaches who helped me at different times. Each one of these three people, before they became like famous, you know, or established in their careers, they went through a rough patch and they, all three of them thought about killing themselves. They even came up with a plan. And at the last minute, they were like, oh, what am I thinking? That's, that's not right. I shouldn't do this. And they, they stopped and they continued on with life. If they had taken their life back earlier, they would not have been there for me at that critical time when I needed what they had to give me. And that's where everybody is. Each one of you are that crit critical hinge point for someone. You each have the ability to change someone's life for the better. And if you're not around, then that moment when they need you, most critical, you won't be there. For them and everybody has something important inside them that they need to share and help other people and that's why that's why it's so important that we just even when it's hard we keep going because i have learned since my son's death i i never realized this we are so connected with each other we need each other and i think going through 2020 a lot of people have been have begun to understand this and understand what my husband and i went through starting in 2019 that we need each other, we need to care about each other, we need to support each other. And, and honestly, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. And that's where we want to have conversations with our teens and, and our parents and the teens' friends. Conversation, if we don't talk about it, then if you don't address it, you just can't fix it. So that's what we do uh, with Perfecting Destiny, that's what we do all the time with Kenyatta there. We are asking our teens and our preteens, our young adults, you know, kids going off to college and things like that. And uh, we are even planning something right now to talk with our teens before they go to college this year, uh, you know, about the kinds of things that would depress them and anxiety and, and all those high, uh, emotions and things that go on with them. But what we really want to do is have people to feel comfortable talking about it. It doesn't feel good to have to ask a person in your family or your teens or something, uh, have you thought about hurting yourself or have you thought about committing suicide? Have you thought about these kinds of things? and get some conversation going on. You mentioned if the people had not stopped, just started to uh, reflect on what would happen if they were gone. Uh, you mentioned that. And we want them to just, whatever your plans were to just drop that. If it's a firearm, if you have thought about uh, opioid, drugs, suicide, whatever your thoughts were, to drop that and, and to get some help. That's what we're teaching our teens and our adults, anybody that we can right now. When I, uh, as a life coach, whenever I'm talking with teenagers, sometimes, and um, Kenyana just, Kenaya just mentioned it, you know what uh, they want to say to me is that they just want somebody to know where they are, to feel the pain that they're feeling, to hear what they're saying yeah. without saying it. So, I mean, and, it's, and sometimes it seems to be difficult for teenagers to talk or when they talk, they don't think that people are hearing them. So that's where we come in as adults. And um, if you'll mention just a little bit more about our friends, our friends have the biggest influence on us. And Kanaya knows that. Uh, even Malaysia knows that, you know, and, and now we're having kids committing suicide that are 12 years old. And every time I hear something like that, it takes a piece of my heart. It, it does. It, it does. It takes a piece of my heart. And the one thing that we say is, how did I miss the signs? How, 
how did I miss that this was happening? Mm -hmm. What could I have done more? So talk with us, you mentioned the friends again, put us just some more about uh, okay. what friends can do. From your my book, my my son's friend wrote me a, a letter, and it was so good. I I had it added it added at the end of my book, so um, it's now in the book. And she wrote me these four pages that told about how she had known my son for two years in high school, and how they got really close. And he told her of his struggles, just uh, just like you mentioned, your friend was telling you about struggles. He would tell her of his struggles, how he, how he felt suicidal, um, but he he said, I'm not going to do it because that would hurt my family, so I'm not going to do it. And she wrote me a letter and sent an email and said that, you know, I knew he talked about it, but I didn't think it was ever serious enough. And, and I thought about telling you, but I didn't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. My wish is that she had reached out to tell me because then maybe I could have intervened in some way but she just didn't think it was bad enough even though he said he was thinking about suicide because this was after his therapy this was after he told me he was fine once again he didn't tell me that he was still struggling I couldn't see any signs any outward signs that he was struggling he didn't seem like he was struggling and so I would say that as as friends in some way help help your friend if they are struggling to get help whether it's by talking to their parents, if that's a, a safe place to do that in, or maybe it's, um, you can Google free suicide resources in my area, or look up different resources. A lot of times um, the state will, will put something together. There's the, the suicide hotline. I, I think it's 888. Um, so there's a suicide hotline where you can go ahead and talk to someone. Uh, but there, there are ways for you to help your friends so that you never have these regrets and thinking, wow, you know, if I had said something, maybe things could be different. Um, I will tell you something that happened to me as a parent. This was five, six years ago. My daughter at the time, youngest daughter, uh, had her phone taken away. I know that's shocking for teenagers to get their phones taken away, but she lost that privilege for a little bit. And my husband and I were kind of going through our messages, looking and seeing, and parents, you know, you pay that bill, they live at home, you absolutely have those rights, looking through our messages. And she, she had a close relationship with one of the boys from school. And he said in his texting back and forth to her, he said, I am so depressed, I'm feeling suicidal, I just don't want to live. Okay. Now, as a parent, what are my choices? This was, this was shocking. You know, this was, like I said, about five, six years ago. And I thought to myself, if that were my child texting, as a parent, I would want to know. Mm -hmm. And so I called this boy's parents and I said, this is a very awkward conversation for me. I'm sorry that we're having it. But as a parent, I would want to know this. Your son texted this to my daughter. I am sure this boy is still alive. I am sure that his parents were grateful that I was able to speak out and they went and, and had a talk with him and kind of worked some things out because he was feeling a lot of pressure from his parents. And so I look back on that and I am so grateful that that boy is still alive mm -hmm. and I am grateful that I had the strength to overcome embarrassment to reach out to his family. Because this, like I said, this was five, six years ago. And it's, this was not a comfortable conversation for me five, six years ago. This is what we can do to help other people to say that you matter enough to me that I'm going to step outside my comfort zone and ask you if you're feeling suicidal or reach out to your parents or help in some way because I care. That's great. If all of us would do that very same thing, but it's difficult. It is difficult. It is difficult, particularly, you know, in your families and uh, things like that. Uh, it is almost time for us to bring our hour in. We've got some people on the line that might want to uh, throw a nugget out to people or to say that 
don't be ashamed or to say something that might would help our uh, audience if there is, um, you can certainly do it maybe uh, right at this time uh, during our show. I would say to anybody that don't take it lightly. Don't take it lightly when you, when, when, when uh, your people start. One of the signs that I've learned as a coach is that when teens start to isolate themselves and they don't want to be bothered with anybody, I've learned that when teens start to uh, write about death and start to be obsessed with death, I've learned that sometimes teens will start to uh, engage in behavior that is not becoming of them, uh, whether it be substance abuse or whether it be uh, other kinds of things that are just not becoming of them. So what I want to say to our audience is, if you observe these kinds of things, let's help them to live. And as Ms. Locke just said that, uh, step out of our comfort zone. One of the reasons I'm wearing this shirt today is that this is what we ask people to step out of your comfort zone and to help them to live. We want to get some help for you. Um, when, we're, when we're talking about teens that are not going to help themselves, then all of us are here for that team. So I would love to have had, you know, maybe some of our pastors, uh, some of our youth leaders, some of our recreation uh, coaches and these kinds of people. And what we'll have to do is take this message to them because now they have just got to have it. This message has got to get out to our public. When you're having three people in a row, I mean, you mentioned like 14 teens in a school setting and I heard that they, they, they cluster like three this week. And that is just something that all of us need to address. And it is not a comfortable conversation. I, I had one of the teens to say to his grandmother, he said, uh, grandmother, he said, where was that shirt when I was trying to talk to my, to, uh, my friend? He said, it just would have made it easier for me. Exactly. So everything that we can to make it easier for the conversation. And that's one of the ways we can do it. This, this is a visual that just says, stop, think about it for a minute, drop the intention and let us help you to live. This suicide prevention. And that's a method that our teens and our adults, we've got some people that uh, have their shirts on now. And we've got some people that are ordering their shirts. Everything to say to our teens, we love you and we want you here. The other thing as a parent, I, you know, I've tried to be more accepting and less judgmental and less critical, honestly, whether it's with my children or other people, because if we're criticizing or judging, our kids aren't going to come to us. Our, our loved ones, our friends are not going to come to us. And we just have to understand that's so important. And so if, you know, Malaysia and you and your mom, if you've created a, a safe place where you can come and tell your mom that, hey, I'm having a rough day and things are hard and it's, it's a little bit too much for me right now, where you can feel safe telling her about how you feel, then, then she can support you more, right? And so it's important that our kids feel that it's safe to talk about what they're going through and that they're not going to be criticized and, and judged and pushed, pushed on when, when they're struggling. Mm. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Malaysia, did you hear that? You hear that, Malaysia, with your mom sitting right there? You got your grandmother here. And look, uh, one, uh, Miss Sutton said this is a really yeah. great conversation. And she says it needs to happen more. And she says that, you know, a lot of time people don't show up to conferences when you just say the word suicide because of the stigma that it has. Sometimes they're afraid and sometimes they don't want to. And you know what I'm thinking? Sometimes they might not want to live or the memory has such uh, stigma that they don't want to go back there or they just rather forget it. But we're learning to help each other. 
And, and that's the one thing as a, as a parent, you know, uh, when my father died, I didn't want to talk about his suicide. When the high schoolers two cities over died, I didn't want to talk about it. I was in denial. And what I now want to point out is that because suicide is so rampant, it's an epidemic. The numbers are such that if you have not been impacted by suicide, you will be. And that's how critical it is. Honestly, it is so critical. And you never know who it is that's hurting and who might take their life. If we can just speak up and tell people, you know, I never miss an opportunity now to tell someone how much I love and appreciate them. When one of my family members is leaving or I'm saying goodbye to someone, I never want to leave with a cross word. It might be the last word they hear from me. So just be more sensitive and just think, how can I be kinder to other people instead of, um, may be sharp and harsh. Just always remember, this could be the last conversation you have. And, and how would you want them to remember that? I appreciate that too. I appreciate that. And for all of you all that are on today, if you go back and look at her link, uh, what did we say it was? Um, LarkDeanGalley.com. Okay, LarkDeanGalley.com. If you go back and look, and then you can go back and examine the book and you can read some of the posts that people have sent to her saying, you know, that my child has committed suicide. Several times a week, she's getting those kinds of messages. Uh, uh, Kanaya said, uh, another thing that we need to look at is we, we can't always look at them and tell that they're suicidal. She says, uh, people don't look depressed that are depressed. What does depressed look like? You know, what does anxiety look like? What does that dark place look like? Uh, she did mention something about, uh, you know, being there and not being in a conversation and glazed over eyes and those kinds of things. But a lot of times we don't get to that point. And uh, Miss Sutton said, it's a good point. Some do not look depressed and they do a great job how they really, really feel. And what did you find that in your, in the case of your son that, he had a great way of hiding it and saying, I'm good, I'm good. He did. I never, I never knew. I never would have known. No signals. It just, uh, three things happened all at once, kind of came together at all these events, just happened to collide. And it just happened to be a moment where he thought, you know, why keep trying? And he just ended his life. And, and that's the thing, these small things can build and build and build until it's just too much. And they're just like, why bother? Uh, did you mention what method he used to end his life? Or? So, so he, he um, shot himself. Um, the males tend to be more um, su successful. Okay, I air quotes. They tend to... Uh, follow through more with, with suicides because they tend to take a more violent approach. Females, while they might attempt as much or actually more than males because their, their approach is not always violent, they don't always succeed. Uh, succeed. And that's a terrible way to say that. Um, so, so we just have to remember that the, the, the males tend to go towards a, a very aggressive, violent approach, which is why more males end up taking their lives by suicide. Uh, Miss, uh, Miss Jones said that uh, a lot of people that are suicidal wear masks. You're not, she, she, she's saying wearing masks and I'm sure she is saying they are covering up what yes. they're really feeling. Yes, exactly. And that's why it's hard to know. It is. Is there another comment from anybody that want to um, put it in the feed or if you want to say it uh, yourself, do know that we appreciate you taking out this time. And do you know what I do know? What I do know that every time you talk about it, it gives somebody else um, just a little bit more comfort and it gives them a little bit more courage to say, I need to address this. Because we were coming on today, I did get a call from some of our friends to say that they'll be on uh, 
they'll be on, but they won't be, you know, on the face. Um, you know how sometimes it takes us a minute to get dressed, but uh, because they've seen another person, you know, with the shirts and we were talking about the suicide, that they're going to help to get the message out because they've had people in their family to commit suicide. So what I really want you to do is go to www.lockdeangalley.com. And if you read the book that she's written, it will help you if you know someone that has somebody in their family that has committed suicide and you read her experiences and how she's handling it, that can help somebody else. And uh, I can appreciate that tie to learning to breathe. How did you, cause you know, you know what I already know that and yeah. something like this will take the air out of you. It will. Well, the, yeah, the title is Learning to Breathe Again, Choosing to Heal After Losing a Loved One to Suicide. And I will tell you that during this whole time with my son's passing, it was so hard. Everything was hard. Even, even breathing was hard. I'd sometimes forget to even breathe and I'd take it like a big gasp of air because everything hurt and everything was hard. And my point was that when you're trying to go through something that's this hard, it's even breathing. You have to learn how to breathe all over again. And the other thing is that you have to choose to heal no matter what it's from. Uh, we all have different experiences that are very hard and uh, we have to choose to rise above and not be a victim. And so I could have easily gone into a very dark hole when my son passed away. And I realized that the only way I could find purpose and meaning to go forward is by sharing his story in the hopes that it will help change the life of someone else. Because if I can change one life, I've changed many lives because that one life will go on to help other people. And that's my goal. That's my whole goal. And I appreciate that response because that is what I know from having worked with people that have had those suicidal tendencies and when they have uh, tried and it didn't happen and that they are here now and I'm looking at the value and the things that their lives had added to other people. It is just wonderful. And I have to say that it's an act of God that it didn't happen because of what they're offering now to their children, to society. It, it, a lot of our lives would not be the same had they been successful in taking their lives. So we're just so happy to have had you here. And we just believe that it's going to get better. At, we, we've had some comments. We, we've got Miss Brown saying it's good information. April says it's awesome and it's needed. Jim and Gwen says interesting, great conversation. And Angela says, we appreciate you taking out your time to share your message with us and it's going to change lives forever. Quentin says, uh, it's awesome. Shana says, it's great information. It is wonderful information and we will be reposting it so that people that were not able to get here with us live, that they'll be able to get the replay. We'll keep in touch, coach. That's how coaches do. We appreciate you and we say blessings to everything that you do and we've got your information. We will look up your post and we'll stay connected and we'll support you. Thank you so, Thank so you. much. Best, best wishes to you all.